Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11. Amen. I do not like the time change. I'll just go ahead and go on record and say that. I don't like it. I don't like it. I like having more afternoon. I like the daylight. Amen. I like it. I don't like it when it gets dark this early. It gets dark, it makes you want to go to bed, and you ain't, you ain't done yet. You still got stuff to do. All right, Genesis chapter 11. Uh, we, we, we went through chapter 10 last week and uh, dealt with it. Now we're going to be dealing with why or how God separated them. Uh, in Genesis 10, we read about how God separated the children of Noah and spread them out. And in chapter 11, we're told how he did it. Okay? Because if you remember, I told you chronologically, 11 comes before 10 as far as chapters. Because uh, uh, there was a verse over there. I can't even remember where it was now. It's in chapter 10. It lets you know. Oh, here it is. In chapter 10, look at verse 5. It says, By were thee. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, everyone after his tongue. Well, God hadn't come down to Babel yet in chapter 10, so that lets you know chapter 10 takes place after chapter 11. Chapter 11 is telling us the how that God divided them, how he caused them to scatter, how he caused them to disperse, across the world. So we're going to be dealing with that. As it's a popular chapter. Most people know when they think of chapter 11, they think of the Tower of Babel. And that's what we're going to be dealing with, the Tower of Babel. And here in Genesis 11, I'm going to give you an outline and nuggets. And uh, when, every time I read chapter 11, I think of that old joke where a uh, wealthy man pulled up and he gave a bunch of money to the church and the pastor recognized him and knew that he was just a, a school buddy he grew up with and wanted to know how he got wealthy and just asked him, how did you get so much money? He said, well, one day I just opened up my Bible. So I, I was thinking about just just hurting myself. He said, I, I didn't know what to do. I, I was at my wit's end and I just opened up my Bible and put my finger down and I put looked down and it was oil. So I invested money in oil. And said it did good. And he said a couple years later, I did the same thing. I opened up my Bible and just dropped my finger down. And whatever it said, he said, I invested in it and did good. And he said, I'm, I'm, I'm wealthy today because of that, that right there. And, and the preacher thought, well, I'm going to try that. So he opened up his Bible and he looked down. And he dropped his finger, looked down, and he said, chapter 11. For those of you who don't know what chapter 11 is in the financial world, it means bankrupt. Yep. <laughs> in chapter 11, you don't have enough. So that's exactly what we're going to find here. Man is bankrupt. Man does not have the ability to reach heaven on his own. Man, without God, is empty. Amen? He's bankrupt. He's going to fall short. So that's a good way to remember what's going on in chapter 11. Now, in this chapter, we're going to see the folly of sinners. We're going to see men trying to build a tower whose top will reach into heaven. We're going to see men trying to uh, exalt themselves above God, basically. So we're going to see the folly of sinners. That'll be verses 1 through 9. Then we're going to see something about the family of Shem. It goes back and gives some genealogy of one of Noah's sons. And uh, the reason why is because someone who is in his line. And that's going to be number three. We're going to see the father of the saints. Abraham shows up. Father Abraham is mentioned in chapter 11. Now we'll deal with him when we come to chapter 12, but he's mentioned there. And the reason for the genealogy is to let you know that Ham come through Shem. Okay? So you can find his nationality like that. And again, no matter how you want to look at it, there's so many different ways we can look at this chapter. You can look at it and you can talk about the rebel. You say, what do you mean the rebel? Well, Nimrod, he's a rebel. He, he's rebelling against God. God said scatter and they won't do it. So you see not only the rebel, 
who disobeys God, he, he, he refuses to submit to his lot. He, he, he's a Hamite. He's supposed to be a servant. So what does he do? He's leading down there in Babel. He is the cause of most of this trouble. So we'll see the rebel. We can look at the rebellion, how they followed uh, Nimrod rather than following God. And then we can look at the rejection. God's going to come down and he's going to reject their works. Just like God always does. God rejects our works. Yes. He rejects them. A lot of people put a lot of emphasis and effort into it, but he still rejected it. Just like he rejected Cain's offering. He'll reject it. And uh, not only that, but we see redemption too. Because uh, uh, this is an amazing book. God may come down and God may judge him harshly, but God does it out of love. And he does it with a long view in mind. He's seeing down the road and he's already dealing with Abraham that's going to be coming. So there's redemption in this story as well. But let's go ahead and look at it. And uh, let, well... For time's sake, I'm just going to get us through here pretty quick tonight. But for time's sake, I'll read it as I go. Most of you should be familiar with this story. And if you're not, I'm going to read it to you anyway. But let's go ahead and get into the outline and nuggets. Number one, Roman numeral one, for those taking notes. We're going to look at the sin first. The sin. That's going to be verses one through four. Look at it. Verse 1, And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found, they found a plain in the land of Sinai, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them throughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven. And let us make a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. So in verses 1 through 4, we see their sin because we know God told them to separate. God wanted them to go out and replenish the world after the flood. Uh, and they didn't. So the sin is obvious there. They're staying together and, and, wanting to, wanting to, and not wanting to be separated. So the first thing, though, I want to point out under the sin, number one under sin, is going to be the communication. Verse 1, they were of one language. One language. That's total integration right there. They're all together. They all can understand each other. They all communicate well. They get along. Everyone spoke the same language. And that shows us something very important. Good communication skills is a, means a lot. You know why a lot of marriages fail? Poor communications. You know why a lot of businesses struggle? Poor communications. You know what happens to a lot of times in armies that cause problems and wars and battles? One of the things they do is try to interrupt the communications. Communication is very important. So when God comes down and confuse, confounds their language and confuses them, it does a number. Now, let me give you something to think about. In the business world, in marriage, and in your home, if there's not good communication, it's doomed to fail. If you, now, now, I know that men and women don't think a lot. Lord, I know that. I mean, I, 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 married, a, I married a girl don't think like me, and I had two girls, and they don't think like me. Amen? Men and women don't think a lot. We think one way and they think another. That don't mean we're smarter and that don't mean they're smarter. It means we just don't think a lot. Amen? Yeah. We, think about, we think about right and wrong. They think about whose feelings is going to hurt. You know what I mean? We're thinking about this will fix it and they're thinking they don't want to hurt somebody or hurt someone's feelings. It's just totally different. Amen? Uh, but if you get a couple that can communicate well, boy, they can do some stuff. You get a business where the communication is good, the business will flourish. Amen? Uh, without good communications, there's going to be problems. But with communication, good communication, look at verse 6. 
And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. So God almost said that nothing would be impossible to them because they had that good communication. You get together with somebody and you get to working and you can do some things if you've got good communication. So what did God do? He come down and confounded their language so they would not do what they had imagined to do. Okay? Uh, what was that one language? That's an interesting thought. The whole earth was of one language and of one speech. Was it English? No. It wasn't French. Maybe it's Chinese. Well, it makes sense, don't it? It'd be Hebrew. It'd be Hebrew. And uh, the way you know that, just hold, hold your place up. Turn over to 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13. Give you a chance to get there. I want you to see this. 1 Corinthians 13. Paul speaking. In verse 1 he says, Though I speak with the tongues of men. You want to know what the tongues of men are? That's different languages. Genesis chapter 2. He gives you a list of different countries. And those different countries speak different tongues. Different languages. So Paul saying, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I become a sound of brass and tinkling cymbal. He said, though I speak in the languages of men and angels. He's talking about that heavenly language. Now, when I say heaven's language, the charismatic sales, charismatic say, well, when you speak in tongues, you're speaking in a heavenly, heavenly language. No, no, no. You're just, you're babbling. That's all you're doing. You're just making noise. You're making a fool out of yourself. That's what you're doing. Tongues in the Bible are languages. English, French, Spanish, so on and so forth. That's what tongues is a reference to. And when he says tongues of angels, he's talking about the language of heaven. So what's the language of heaven? What is the language of heaven? Well, in Revelations 19, let's turn and look at it. Revelations 19, I'll show you something. What do they speak in heaven? Well, we got some proof here what they speak in heaven. Verse 1. And after these things I heard a great voice of much people, where? In heaven, saying, Hallelujah. That is not English, that's not Chinese, that's not... French, that's not Portugal, that's not Dutch, that's Hebrew. So keep going. Verse 3, and again they said hallelujah. Verse 4, and the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down worship God that sat on the throne saying amen, hallelujah. They're speaking Hebrew. Verse 6, and I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude and as the voice of many waters and as the voice of mighty thunder saying, Hallelujah for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. So they're speaking in the Bible in the book of Revelations in Hebrew. Do you know what the Old Testament was written in? Hebrew. Do you know what Adam and Eve most likely spoke? Hebrew. So the first language would have been Hebrew. Amen. Uh, here's something interesting. In Romans 8.15, just jot it down, we'll not turn there. Romans 8.15 and Galatians 4.6, twice we're told that the Holy Spirit, when He moves inside of us, He causes us to cry, Abba, which is Father. We call God Abba for Father. Amen. We're to call Him our Heavenly Father. Amen. So he puts his spirit in us, and that spirit causes us to cry, Abba, Father. All right? So that's interesting, ain't it? So if anybody wants to know what the language of heaven is, it's going to be Hebrew. It's going to be Hebrew. Amen, amen, amen. All right, let's keep going here. Number two, first was the communication, that one language. Now look at the community. Look at verse 2 there. Chapter 11, verse 2. 
And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Sinar. Sinar is near Babylon. It is not Babylon, but it is near Babylon. And in Daniel chapter 2, no, Daniel chapter 1, verse 2, you'll find that it is in Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom when Nebuchadnezzar was king of Babylon. So it was part of Babylon. So uh, that lets you know that they're right there at Babylon when they're going to build this tower. So that's why it's called the Tower of Babel too as well. It's right there at Babylon. So that's the community that they're in. Now let's look at number three, the construction. Look at verse three. And they said one to another, go to, let us make brick and burn them throughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. Now, there's several things that I wanted to, wanted to point out here. The first thing is, notice everything they're building with is artificial material. You say, what do you mean artificial material? Brick's, brick's not artificial, but it's man-made. They made the brick, and they made the slime they used for mortar. You know what mortars, well, you know what uh, brick masons and masons call the mortar? Mud. Mud. Why didn't they use mud? They wanted to make slime for mortar, whatever that was. I looked it up. I suppose several different people had different things. But the point is, man made it. They used brick instead of stone to build. When there's a time when they used stones to build, they decided to make brick and do this. So that shows man's effort. Not God. That shows man is wanting to do it without God. I don't need God. I can do it on my own. We don't need God. You don't need God. We can do this. That's kind of what's going on there. They wanted their own way and they wanted their own path to heaven. Look at verse 4. And they say, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven and let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the uh, upon the face of the whole earth they wanted to they wanted to stay together they did not want to listen to god and separate they wanted to stay together can't we all just get along the ecumenical movement uh united nations that would have been the first united nations right there they met right there in bible amen uh, they wanted everybody together and everybody to get along but notice everything they did, everything, everything in this chapter so far is leading to disaster. Everything. We know they're doing it under Nimrod. We talked about Nimrod last week. Nimrod was, is a picture of the Antichrist. And, uh, uh, but everything they did, they did it wrong. Nimrod shouldn't have even been a leader. He was to be a servant. He was a of uh, Ham's descent. So he was to be a servant, but yet here he is leading. So the wrong leader. Not only did they have the wrong leader, but they had the wrong building materials. They had the wrong motive in building. The motive was to disobey God and do the opposite of God's will. They had the wrong place to build. They had the wrong attitude. See, everything in this chapter is wrong. It was doomed for failure. It was doomed for failure. And, and I wanted to point out something here in verse 3. Uh, verses 3 and 4. I want you to note the word us. Us. Watch this. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them throughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad. There's five times it says us. Let us. Let us. Those five times, five is the number of death, but those five times reminded me of five our wheels of Satan. So that's showing us by what spirit they're following. What spirit is moving them to rebel against God? What spirit is behind Babel? Are you with me? 
What's the spirit behind them? Because you'll notice it was self, it was about me, let us, make us, build us, lest we, you, it was all about me. And it was about exalting themselves, okay? That they could disobey God, basically. Here, I'll show you what I'm talking about, maybe to make more sense. Turn to Isaiah. Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14. In Isaiah 14, you have uh, you have the fall of Lucifer. Verse 12. How thou art fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How thou art cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nation. So we know we're talking about the fall of Lucifer, the fall of Satan. Now notice the five I wills of Satan. Verse 13. Number of rebellion. Okay. Uh, what's going on with Nimrod? He's the rebel. He's rebelling. Okay. Number thir uh, excuse me, verse 13. For thou hast said in thine heart, this is Satan, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Those five I wills showed how selfish he was and how he was self-exalting. He was exalting himself rather than God. And when I seen those us, let us, 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 I noticed there was five of them and I said, there's the key to the spirit that's behind it. You can tell this, that there was a satanic spirit behind that push there going on. And you'll see why in a little bit. Okay. Uh, it's easy for us to sit here today, read the story and think, oh, how stupid were those people. How stupid were they? They had the Word of God. They knew the will of God. Yet, they went against God. How stupid How stupid can you be? But let me ask you a question. Don't you do the same thing? You have the Word of God. You know what the will of God is in a lot of things. And do you do it perfectly? Oh, see, it's easy to read someone else's story and what some, where someone else fell, and point out how ignorant they are, and yet be blind to the very thing in your life. The very same thing can go on in your life sometimes, and you not even see it. All right, uh, let's see. Uh, not only did we see the rebellion uh, there in chapter 11, but you also see religion. Religion is there. You say, what do you mean? Humanism. I don't need God starts right here. A lot of humanism comes out of Babylon. All about man and what he can do. You know what modern education is? Humanism. Humanism. That's what they get taught in school. They don't get taught uh, about God created us and that we need to uh, obey God and seek His will for our lives. No, we're taught they come from monkeys and we've evolved and one day we're going to be as gods in their eyes. We're evolving. We don't need God. Humanism. We are the measure of all things. Right. Survival of the fittest and we're the fittest. We're on top. Amen. That's what they teach is humanism. Now look at verse 4. In verse 4, there's something interesting. They say, go to, let us build brick, excuse me, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven and let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Notice that they want to build a top, uh, a tower whose top, now watch, may reach into heaven, unto heaven. So you've got some commentators that flip out over that. They think that, well, God's, God's in the third heaven and, and there's no way man can build a tower. And then you've got some that say this is man's attempt to reach into outer space. And man does attempt to reach into outer space. We've got space shuttles and satellites and so on and so forth. But it could be as simple as reaching to heaven may have just been the first 
uh, sky, uh, uh, what do you call that, uh, skyscraper. It could have been the first one built that reached the clouds. Amen. So there's several ways you can look at that. But a high rise does make it up to heaven in the sense that it makes it to the, to the clouds. Amen. It's in the clouds. I mean, if you went by a city or seen the clouds uh, low and you can't see the top floors of the buildings, they're so tall. Their tops reaching to heaven. Ain't that interesting? Now, uh, here's something interesting you might not have thought about, but here in chapter 11, under Nimrod, under Nimrod, a Hamite who wasn't supposed to be in that position, a mighty hunter before the Lord. Remember I told you what, that he was hunting deer and turkey and so forth. He was hunting men. He was, he was the first one to enslave people. He was a murderous. He was a, he was a terror. He was a wicked, evil man. That's what he was. But here, under him, you know what he did? He achieved what the United Nations, what the ACLU, what modern science and education desire for today, he achieved it then. What's that? World peace and world unity. He had everybody together. There was one world religion, humanism, and there was one world government, his, and there had been one world currency. Yep. He achieved it right there. And you know what it brought? It brought the judgment of God. Amen. So what they're striving for, they're going to wish they didn't get. Oh, they'll achieve it just for a short period for the Antichrist. Nimrod's a picture of the Antichrist. It, they'll achieve it for just a short time during the tribulation, but judgment's coming. Uh, uh, what this world can't see is that God is a segregationist. Nowhere in the Bible does God talk about unity and get along except in the context of believers. He wants believers to be of one mind, believers to come together and be united. That's the only time God speaks of unity and coming together is among believers. But believers are to come out from among them and be separate. We're to come out from among the unbelievers, out from among the world. So even in that, you see God's a segregationist. So everybody's always trying to shove everybody together. You gotta watch out for that crowd. Watch out for them. All right, so there's a little bit about the sin. Now let's look at Roman number two and we'll deal with the sentence. Look at verse five. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Now, the sentence is given there, uh, right around verse, right after verse 5 there. First thing I want to point out, though, is number one, the concern. Notice in verse 5, and the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men had built. The Lord is concerned with what we do. People think God just made, so there's some, I forget what they're called, they believe that God just made everything and then just sat back and just lets it go. God is concerned with what goes on and God does intervene in the affairs of men. God does care what goes on in our everyday walk. We've talked about that uh, within the last week or so. We've talked about that. The Lord is concerned with what you do. And he closely evaluates everything that we do. He comes down and he evaluates it. He looks at it. He knows why you did it. That's the motive behind it. You know, some people do some great things, but they do it for the wrong reason and they lose a reward. 
Some people do stuff because they like the recognition they get. Some do it because they like the feeling of making someone happy. Some people do it because they like a pat on the back. All these different reasons people do a good thing, but there's only one reason that you should do it. Because it's right, and that's what the Lord wants you to do. You should do right whether you like it or not. Whether you get a pat on the back or recognition or not, you should do it because it's the right thing to do. That's what gets you rewards. But God closely evaluates everything. He even evaluates our attitude while we're doing it. He knows the attitude. You know, some people will... Sometimes you can tell somebody to do something and they'll question you. You think, well, they're not a very good listener. They're not a very good... They're not very obedient. They're not a good employee, maybe, because they question my authority, but they go and do it. Then you have someone, you tell them to do it, but the whole time they do it, they're complaining that, about it to everybody around them, and they cause more trouble than the one that questioned you. you. You see what I mean? So God knows the attitude, and attitude really does mean a lot. Your attitude affects you more than you ever know. One of these days, I hope the Lord lets me preach on just bad attitudes. Bad attitude and baptist. Amen. That would be a good message right there. Because honestly, you can make yourself miserable just from having a bad attitude. You can get up with a bad attitude and ruin your day. You can get up with a good attitude and have all kinds of horrible things happen. But because you had a good attitude, you have a good day. You can go through some horrible things and still have the joy of the Lord in your heart. You can still enjoy life. Life is still worth living, amen? But boy, some people, uh, they can, I, I believe they can find the winning lottery ticket and find a reason to complain. Seriously, I mean seriously. I mean, some people make themselves so miserable. But God shows His love and concern by being interested in what they're doing. He came down to investigate what was going on. You know, the worst thing that God could do to you is to pull back and just let you go because you will self-destruct. I'll self-destruct. If God just let me do whatever I wanted whenever I wanted, I'd probably weigh 500 pounds and be dead of a heart attack 10 years ago. I'd eat myself to death. Amen, amen, amen. Some of you would have too. You know what I mean? I, we'd, we'd overeat, we'd oversleep, we'd do everything to the excess. This flesh don't have any control. The worst thing God can do is just let you do what you want. Now, just, just to remind you, God was concerned then, but He's just as concerned today. He's just as concerned today as what's going on in the churches, what's going on in uh, government, what's going on in your home. He's just as concerned today about those things as it was at Tower of Babel then, okay? Number two, that's the concern. Number two, the condemnation. Look at this. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they all, and they have all one language, and this they began to do. Of all the things they could do, they're doing this. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Uh, they rebel against the Lord's will. They exalt themselves. Uh, they're they, and God always condemns sin. When God comes down and sees sin, God's going to condemn it. He will judge it rightly. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? God is holy. And His holiness demands that He judge sin and that He judges it righteously. And He will. It said there about they, that which they have imagined to do. And when I seen that imagine, I got to thinking about what happened that brought judgment in Genesis 6. In Genesis 6, when God brought the flood upon the earth, Verse 5, it says, And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart were 
only evil continually. Man's imaginations is evil. And I'm telling you, they're no better today. You know what you watch on TV today? The imagination of people. People that sit around and imagine them. They think up these stories. They think up these things. And you sit around and you know what most people are watching? Profanity. Filth. Pornography. It's a putrid mass is what it is. This world is filled with filthy, vain imaginations. Amen. And they're evil continually. According, you know, we exalt men and we praise men and they give them awards and stars and the, oh, the director award and this award and that award and they applaud them. But according to the Bible, you know what man is? Dust. Dust. And you ladies like from dusting in the house? That's what you're made up of. According to the Bible, when God looks at us, He remembers we're but dust and ashes, according to the Bible. That's in Psalm 103, 14. He also sees us as dung spread on the ground. You say, preacher, that's horrible, that's terrible. That's in the Bible. Job chapter 20 and verse 7. When he looks at man, he sees that us as withered grass. That's right. Grass is, is here for a moment and then it's gone. It burns like nothing. You'll find withered grass in 1 Peter 1, 27. We're like grasshoppers. Like grasshoppers. You ever try to catch a grasshopper? It's here one minute and gone the next. Grasshoppers. You'll find that in Isaiah 40, verse 22. According to Jeremiah, our hearts are wicked. That's right. Jeremiah 17 verse 9. Desperately wicked according to the Bible. And according to John 3 and verse 3, we're born dead. There's something dead in us. Amen. That's why you must be born again. Okay. We're born wrong. And according to the Bible, man at his best state is altogether vanity. Psalms 39 5. And the whole book of Ecclesiastes deals with that as well. Number three, we looked at his concern and, con and condemnation. Now let's look at the correction. Look at verse seven. He says, go to, let us go down and there confound their language. He's going to go down and confound their language. Uh, I like that. Look at that. Go to. That comes from verse three. Verse three they said one to another, go to, let us make brick. So God says in verse 7, after seeing their mess, he puts the words back on them. He says, go to, let us go down, and there confound their language. God puts it back on them. A little sarcasm there it goes a long way sometimes, but God puts it back on them. And if you're wondering who he's talking about there when God says, let us, that would be God the, God the Father talking God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. That's the Trinity. Go to, let us go down. So the Trinity's in action here, and he confounds their language. Now picture it, they're working on the city, and you got a guy on the phone here, he's talking to the parts guy, and all of a sudden, the parts guy can't understand the thing he's saying. What? 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 He don't know what's going on, so he hangs up. He goes over here, and he's going to tell the boss that the parts man's flipped out, and they can't understand anything. Somebody standing next to him don't understand. Neither one of them, they sound like a bunch of chickens clucking. They don't know what's going on. And finally, one of them looks at the other and says, did you, see, did you hear what he said about your mama? I mean, I imagine it got ugly. Was he talking about my sister? Was he talking about my wife? Before you know it, they'd have been fighting, uh, just looking at each other funny and mean, thinking each other stupid. They'd have been fighting, and they had to separate. Lack of communication leads to fussing, fighting, and confusion. I don't care if it's in the business world, the political world, or in your home. Lack of communication leads to confusion. And it'll tear you apart. It'll drive you apart. And that's what the Lord did. The way the Lord caused them 
to listen to him, to obey him. When they refused to obey him, he judged them. He confounded their language and caused them to separate. Now, he corrects them by confounding their language, according to verse 8. And he stopped them from, from going any further and building the tower and building the city. He stopped them and then he separated them. In verse 10, excuse me, in chapter 10, we see how he separated them. He separated them by the races. And not only did he separate them, but last week I showed you he, had, he put boundaries there. And if you want the verses, again, that's Acts 17, 26, and 27. God has made of all, all nations one blood, but he set the bounds thereof. And then you'll find it again in Deuteronomy 32, verses 7 and 8. God separated the children of Adam, and he gave them bounds. They could come so far, they weren't supposed to cross. The problem today is everybody's so messed up, nobody knows where they are. Uh, let's see, I'm running out of time, so let me speed up a little bit. In chapter 11, all the nations are integrated. They're one. But the result was judgment, confusion, and God coming down and separating them. Okay? Sin will always bring judgment. Sin will always bring God's judgment. We talked about how God separated them last week. Uh, last week I kept calling Japheth, Jephthah, because I'd been studying Jephthah. I'm going to preach on Jephthah for a long, but, I was, I, but anyway, I kept calling Japheth, Jephthah last week. Uh, but here's a note that I wanted to point out before we close this chapter out. I want to make sure I say, say this and get this for you. Tongues are languages. God brought in the different languages. Somebody was talking French, somebody was talking Chinese, somebody was talking Hebrew, somebody was talking all the different languages. Okay? But every dispensation brought something that stayed. Every dispensation. When Adam and Eve fell in the Garden of Eden, death entered in. Yes, sir. Death is still here today. Then when they go in uh, uh, to the conscious, there's labor for the, by the sweat of their face is how they're going to eat. That's how you eat today. You have to work. If you don't work, your body will feel full of toxins. If you don't sweat, you'll feel full of toxins and you'll poison yourself. You've got to sweat. You need to move. Sweating's good for you. Amen? So that's still here. Uh, Magnified grief during a labor. All the ladies say amen. Y'all know that's right. How about this one? Under human government, under no edit covenant, guess what came in? The death penalty. It's still binding today. What else came in right here at the end? This is before he had the covenant with Abraham. We're still under the no edit. What happened? The languages are confounded. And guess what? People still have problems getting along. People still have problems communicating today. I can go down to I can't go down to South America and understand what they're talking about. Down there in part of the places where they speak Spanish. I can't go over into France. I don't speak French. I can't speak German. Don't put me in Germany. I don't know what in the world they're talking about. Don't put me in West Virginia. I can't speak, I, I, I can't speak redneck. Definitely don't put me in New York. I don't know Yankee either. Amen. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? That languages is still confounded, and they'll be that way till the Lord comes and straightens this mess out. Amen. There'll always be that problem. All righty. Different languages. Now, Babel, verse verse nine. Uh, therefore, the name of it. Therefore, is the name of it called Babel. Now, Babel. Uh, is known as Babylon later in history. You can find that in Jeremiah 4, Daniel chapter 1, Daniel chapter 2, and Daniel chapter 3. It talks about Babylon. That's the same, same place. God confounded their language 
And most religions lead to confusion. Oh, there's something interesting in this one verse I want you to see too. I'm trying to hurry up and give you some nuggets. Uh, let me find it. Uh, verse 4. Verse 4. show you something you may never notice before. It was pointed out to me. I would have not noticed it. But look at this. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may, may reach into heaven. Now I told you, not only did we see rebellion because they're coming together, but we also see religion because they're going to exalt themselves, they're exalting man over God's will. That, that's where humanism come in. We don't need God, we can do it on our own. But notice, every man-made religion, all of them fall under this same category. Yeah. You may go to heaven or you may not. They don't have eternal security, they have no assurance. Right. Whose top may, as in maybe, maybe not. It may reach Are you with me? Now, we understand that it means that who's talking may reach into heaven. But I thought, man, that makes some good preaching right there. Because all the world's religion, all man-made religions, reject eternal security. Yes, sir. Think about that. All the false religions and cults today reject assurance of salvation. Yes. They don't know for sure they're going to heaven. Whose top may go to heaven? That's just interesting to me. I thought it was fun. All right, number number three in your outline. Well, before I give you three, let me give you this here too. Here's another nugget. Uh, if you want more on Babel and Babylon, uh, it's its own study, and it is a it is a multi night study. It'll take you a while. The Definitive work on Babel and Babylon is Two Babylons by Hislop. I think that's his name. Two Babylons. He covers it thoroughly. And I'm telling you, he exposes it for what it is. It's false religion. It's, it's papal worship. And it goes into Nimrod and the false religions that came out of that place. And it ties into his wife. Now, this is what's so funny. Babel means confusion. In Leviticus 18, in verse 23, when a woman goes to have relations with an animal, God called it confusion. So when you run the word confusion, you see false religion, you see the Tower of Babel, and then you run it over the next time you see it is a woman with a beast. Well, guess how the book ends? False religion has a woman riding a beast in Revelation, and right. she's called Babylon the harlot. Right. Great Babylon and the harlot. So there's some stuff there. You ought to really get into that. Uh, two Babylons. Hislop, I believe is right. H-I-S-L-I-P. I think that's how you spell his name. Yes, sir. All right. So look him up and grab that book if it's still in print. I think it was first published in 1916. So it's nothing new, but it's been republished several times. So it's still out there. You may even be able to find it free online. A lot of, a lot of Christian websites may even post it where you can find it free online and it'll give you some stuff. Uh, all roads lead back to Rome, basically. And uh, you'll find, you'll see the connection there. But anyway, number three, the Shemites. The Shemites. Now, the rest of the chapter, I'm not going to take time to go through it, but look at verse 10. These are the generations of Shem. Now, that's one of Noah's signs. Shem, that's where the Jewish nation come from. And the reason it's listed here, it gives his genealogy. The reason he is listing the genealogy here is to show you who's coming from him. Look at verse 26 and look who shows up. Abraham. Yeah. Not only does he want to show you Abraham, but you go on down there verse 29 and he'll show you Abraham's wife. See her? Right. Look at verse 30. There's a little nugget there about Abraham's wife. 
she's barren. Right. Why is that important? Because God's going to perform a miracle, and here, uh, Sarah, that's going to be, uh, he's going to change her name to Sarah. Ab Abram goes to Abraham and Sarah to Sarah. And, and, but here, why he points it out is because God's going to do a miracle, and Sarah is going to begot a son who's going to be the type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amazing. God has to perform a miracle. He takes her womb when she's past the age of having children, and he quickens it, and she's able to have a child. It's a miraculous birth. So she's a type of Mary, in a sense, foreshadowing what... God always shows us what he's going to do. In fact, he shows us seven times. It's pretty interesting. You know, there's seven women in the Bible that were barren. Seven. And all seven of those women have children that go on to be a great type of the Lord Jesus Christ right. or Israel or the church. Amen. God uses them in a great way. So when women are barren, God can step in. It may be God stopping it, and he may use it for a purpose. But when God steps in, he definitely has a purpose. And here I'll just list them for you. Sarah. That her, she, had, she finally has a son, Isaac, who's a type of Christ. Rebecca, barren for 20 years, and then Jacob's born. Israel, what, what, a, what, a, what a picture of that. Then you have Rachel, she's barren, and then finally has Joseph, the greatest type of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Bible, right. is Joseph. Then you have Hannah. Remember, Baron Samuel, the most famous Baron woman. She prayed and the prophet saw her and uh, the priest saw her and thought she was drunk and all that stuff. But the Lord heard her prayer and gave her a child. He was a prophet and a priest and a picture of Christ. Yes, sir. Okay. Manoah's wife, yes. Samson's mama, was barren until an angel of the Lord showed up and then she has a child, Samson, who in several times, several places, is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, the Shulamite, uh, uh, she has a child. Finally, she's barren, she has a child, uh, and it dies. And it's resurrected. Elijah brings it back. Woo, what a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see how the Lord's using it? And then lastly, Elizabeth uh, was barren, and then John the Baptist, he's the forerunner of Christ. Yes, sir. Amen. All right. Now, under the Shemites, you see the clan. It, it breaks it down and shows you them. And then you see the childlessness, uh, for those of you taking notes. Uh, and then in chapter 12, it goes back to dealing with individuals. In the beginning, you had God dealing with Adam and Eve, and then it went to dealing with their children, Cain and Abel, and then it went to dealing with them as a, a Noah, do, and then he's dealing with them as a just a group, people, the nations. Now he's going to go back, and he's going to call back, call out of the nations who he's divided across the world. He's going to call out one man, Abraham. And he's going to make a great nation of him. And what we'll be reading will be the story of them. Now, I've got where I wanted to go through Genesis. I got the doctrinal meat, the first 11 chapters. I've got most of the doctrinal meat covered pretty well for you. When we get into Abraham, it's going to be more like biography. It's dealing with the history of Abraham and God dealing with him and his family. That, to me, is more of a Sunday school kind of material. I can give you some good practical stuff, but doctrinally, I may not be dealing with Genesis on Wednesdays. I may pick another book, and when we get Sunday school cranked back up, I do plan on finishing Joseph, and then we can jump on Abraham. Because remember, we'd started Joseph and been dealing with Joseph for a while. I want to finish up Joseph, and then we'll come back to Abraham. All right, any questions on anything in Genesis 1 through 11, chapters 1 through 11? Any questions? We've covered some meat in there. If you get to thinking about what all we've covered, there's been a lot in there. A lot in there. How many, Brother, how many studies have we done? Do you even know? Any questions or comments? Yes, sir, Brother. 
chapter 4, it says the top may reach. So if you look at Nimrod built the city, and under his hand they were building a tower that reached from the earth to heaven. The Roman Catholic Church has got a man they call a pontiff. Yeah. That word means bridge builder. In the Bible it means bridge builder from man to God. So I believe that Nimrod started the Catholic Church in a sense. You're right. You're, there, there's, he is connected big time. He and his wife, again, to, uh, two Babylons. Have you got that book, Two Babylons? Brother, you would love it. You would absolutely love it. It exposes the yes, corruption sir. of Babylon, and it takes the connection between Nimrod and the, paper, the, the papacy, the Pope, Roman Catholicism. It lays it out there. All right, any other questions or comments? That's the one that Rome worships them on the 25th of December. Yeah. And uh, she gave that to the world. That came out of Babylon. So when you look at Babylon, there's so many things that come out of Babylon. The Jewish Talmud comes out of Babylon. What a mess. And so uh, here we are in, the, in this county, and there's so much of Babylon here in our churches, and it's uh, sad, really. It is sad. The church is full of Rome, and they do it through television, they do it through just, I mean, people watch TV, it, it just dumbfounds me, how people will watch TV. They've got a Bible-believing church where we meet on Wednesday, and we have Bible studies, we open the floor for any questions and anything like that, and they get mad and won't believe a thing that I read and show them out of here. But they'll go turn on that TV, the History Channel, and they'll believe some of the most stupid, nonsensical things you've ever heard. And think that's Bible. Or they'll watch some movie. And because when a movie, when Hollywood wants to portray Christian, they show a Catholic. Catholics aren't Christian. Now, there's some Christians that are Catholic. They're just messed up doctrinally. But Catholicism is not Christianity. No. It's wicked. I did a it's study. from Babylon. I did a study on the word barren here. The first time you find it here. I wrote about three or four yellow pages of the history of that word, the etymology of the word, where it came from. How did you get in the Bible? Well... There's a great lesson there for us. Sarah was barren, but you and I have to be barren. We have to produce. We're supposed to bear fruit. Amen. As Christians, we're to bear fruit. You say, how do I bear fruit? Win others to Christ. Reproduce. What am I reproducing? Yourself, a Christian, a believer. Amen. That's good stuff. How many was it, Brother Bradley? We spent 22 weeks in 11 chapters. We covered it faster than I thought we would. Amen. That's still, that's still a lot of, we, we covered a lot of ground. All right, no questions or comments. It's about 12 after, so let's all stand. We'll just be dismissing a word of prayer. Help me pray about where to go. I, I may even jump on a New Testament book. We've been in the Old Testament a little while. Unless you got something you just really want to know something about. If you've got a study or something you'd like, to study, let me know, and if the Lord will allow me, I'll dig and we'll, we'll deal with it. If anybody's got anything, yes, sir. Visitation Saturday. Visitation this Saturday. We'll be meeting at 10, 15, 10, 30, and we'll take off and do some visiting. Uh, any of you men want to come go with us or uh, husbands and wives together, be fine. Amen. Just come and we'll, we'll do some visiting. All right choir be singing this Sunday so be praying about it. Boy, I tell you what, felt good hearing the youth choir Sunday, didn't it? Yeah, it did. Woo! Boy, I felt good. I, I enjoyed hearing them. Been looking forward to that. Uh, amen, amen, amen. How's Junior Church going, brother? It's going good? How many did you have? About, about 20. Okay, so it's, 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 so it's climbed back up a little bit. Amen. Going good. Feeling good in there. All right. So continue to pray. The Lord keep this mess out of here. And 
Uh, and we're going to slowly, surely, maybe open up and get some more stuff going. Amen.